Hello everyone, uh, hello iedereen. I speak Nederlands, but I will speak in English. Um, it's fun to be here again, and uh, I live in New York, and it's a bit crazy over there, and it's always very normal here, so that always feels good. Uh, everything back to normal. Um, just like most of you guys, I went to art school here in the Netherlands, and I remember teachers always want to tell you what to do, and I was, well, what do you mean? Yeah, th that's okay, but what does it say, and what are you trying to say, and I think you should research a little bit more, and what are you thinking, and are you sure? And I hated this question, are you sure? It's a basic question that any creative endeavor, there's always a moderator, there's always someone between you and your audience, so there's always, when you make a book, there's a publisher, and they're like, well, what are you trying to say, and can we, can we sharpen it a little bit? And if you're working with a gallery, I don't know if that's the best work right now. Maybe we should do this. And that, that, that your voice is always diluted. So I thought from the beginning, OK, we have the internet. And of course, I existed before the internet, so I was making drawings and photos, these type of things. And then you can make a website and put pictures of your drawings, um, which I thought it's not as interesting as the drawing itself. It's smaller. Why don't I make images specifically for the web? And, and what can I do on the web that you cannot do in sculpture, that you cannot do in oil paint, etc.? So, things like this. So I thought it's interesting. We have a whole history of depiction. So basically what artists do is they Artists have to have a lot of free time, so they can sit around and look at stuff. And then they start to think, why is a jello more interesting than a cake? And then they can think about that all day. So it's very important that you're not busy. And then what I find interesting about a jello is that a jello is not a static object. It's something that has a very specific way of moving. And it, it, I saw it in a Tom and Jerry cartoon, but I thought it's more interesting not to have a jello that's moving on its own, but a jello that moves when you touch it. So this is a different paradigm in representation. It, it, that was my main interest in the beginning. You guys probably went to my high school drawing teacher. The first assignment is make a drawing of your left hand. So you look at your left hand, and then you try to draw it, and it doesn't look like your hand, but it, it's interesting that in art, you can see the way an artist sees the world. So it's, it's almost like teleporting yourself in the brain of the artist and seeing the world the, the way another person sees it. And so this is not a cartoon of a drawing. It's not an animation. It's not a, a film. We've seen, we've seen all kinds of explorations of hands in, in the history of art, from the first hands in caves where they threw pigment on the wall and you see the leftovers of where someone's hand was 30,000 years ago, to this hand. Um, so. It's, it's an interactive hand, and then it, you can make it say whatever you want. And then I always like to add a little bit of annoyance, or so the hand moves back before you can do all five of them, so, or you have to be really fast. So it, it, I was interested in the beginning of, of uh, when you're a child, you're exploring things, you're, you're starting to see things, you're starting to smell things. I think. Being a child is a lot like being on acid, so all your senses are one. You just, everything comes in, you have no idea. So you're exploring, and you basically want to put everything in your mouth. That's how you discover the world. And then your parents tell you, don't touch that. Don't touch that. And I was interested in, in touch, in understanding the world through touch. Uh, this is a roll of toilet paper on papertoilet.com. And then what you can do is you can unroll it. That's all the function. It, what was interesting about um, the internet is that you're showing things, but people don't know whether it's art or whatever it is. And when you Google the word toilet paper, there's not so many websites dedicated to toilet paper. So this is on the first page of Google. And then a lot of people show up, and they're like, what? Uh, OK. What's going on? I don't know. Uh, yeah. and then. That you start to realize that if you s keep scrolling, it's actually shrinking. And so it also remembers how much toilet paper you had left. So you come back, and it's still there. <laughs> and then you scroll a little more, 
And then if you scroll all the way down, you run out of toilet paper. And then a lot of people started emailing me. It's like, I ran out of toilet paper. Can I get some more? <laughs> and I know, sorry, it's over. <laughs> um, it's funny. There's a trick to get new toilet paper. It's not that hard. But for some reason, double clicking is something you don't do on the internet. But that's the trick. You just double click. <laughs> but don't tell anyone. But it, it, there were a lot of, it, I like this effect of uh, art being on the internet and, and it, it's kind of a very innocent viewing because when you go to a museum or gallery, there's such a weight to the experience. There's like, oh, I'm in the gallery, I'm in the museum, who does this high and mighty artist thing? Instead on the internet, you're confronted with something, you have no idea, is this an ad? Is this a thesis project of a student? Is this a, a club? Is this... A, who knows what it is? So this is deepblackhole.com. <laughs> so th that's it. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a Dutch landscape. So some are more intentionally funny. Some turn out to be funny that I didn't intend to be funny. This. I think anyone in the Netherlands has spent time in the train, and that, that's what you see. Um, I find it very interesting that we don't look out windows that much anymore. It, the, the screen is much more interesting. There's so much content there that uh, that's why I made this website, openthiswindow.com. So. <laughs> That's a window in the Netherlands, and then um, here's a window in New York. <laughs> yeah. I, I, it's funny, living in New York, and I really like Dutch doctors because they, they don't over-medicate. They're like, yeah, you're fine. And American doctors are like, oh, you should do this and this and this, and you need to pay a million. Um, so I was Googling Dutch doctors, and I found a Dutch dentist. And it turns out that a lot of Dutch people living in New York grind their teeth because of the constant noise of the city that they're not used to. And so it's, a, it's a phenomenon for people from outside of New York living there that you, you're just constantly stressed even if you don't think you are. So I try to make these chill places on the internet. Uh, this is uh, this empty room. Um, so one of the themes is, is interactive depiction. And another theme for me is interactive abstraction. And uh, it started with this website where I'm interested in, especially as designers, everybody knows the problem of, of a fluid canvas. So every Every website, every screen is different, every orientation is different. So normally when you make an art object, you're like, okay, it's going to be about this big or this or this. And I remember being in school and we were talking about websites and it's like, how big is a website? Is it 800 by 600? Is it 1920? It's, no, it's, it's fluid, so you have to think of that. And I, I thought that's an interesting approach to composition um, of not having control. So. I work with these rules. What, this was the rule, whenever you click in an area, it'll cut it in half. So cut in half, cut in half, cut in half. And so basically the viewer is deciding on what the work looks like within my parameters. Then the next rule, um, instead of cut in half, is you have the screen and then you click somewhere and it'll make four lines towards wherever you clicked, and then it'll make three lines. And so again, you're making a work. And it, yeah, it's an ongoing fascination with these very simple rules. This is a, a line that bounces off the edges. And so, I, 
I don't know if this is a personal problem. I, I tried to write on my blog, and then um, I wrote this whole text about why I should never make an object. Because objects are stupid, objects are in galleries, they're for rich people, objects are heavy, I'm digital, I don't need anything, blah, blah, blah. And moving images are never objects. A moving image can appear somewhere, it's a different thing than a moving object. So, and so I'd, I'd written everything down, why I believe websites are awesome and why objects are stupid, and uh, why electric images are more interesting than analog images, and blah, blah, blah. And then it turns out I was all wrong. So websites are great, but it's not everything. And I was asked to make a, we were looking at a, So this project started by, uh, we were making an invite card for an exhibition. And uh, they said, oh, we have this lenticular producer. So lenticulars are these things that you might know from postcards, where you have a girl in a bikini, and you do this, the bikini comes off, or stuff like that, and, and, and uh, rulers. And it turns out you can make them very large as well. So I made a test, and I made that jello uh, wobbling in, in lenticular. But the screen is very smooth. It's like 60 frames a second. The lenticular is four or five, maybe 10 frames. So it looks really clumsy when you're trying to animate something. But then I made some abstract ones. And then the ghosting, the, the area between the frames, becomes very interesting. So these works that you see here are made of four frames that I sent to the producer. And they're interlaced. And so you're basically, depending on your angle, you're seeing either frame one, two, three, or four. But because it's such a the, the ghosting, the thing between all the frames, messes everything up, it becomes very interesting. So then it really becomes infinite instead of four steps. So then this starts to happen. And uh, I was very surprised in the beginning. And it's, it's an interesting way of working where I don't have that much control. I make these four frames, and it's always a surprise how it ends up. So red after blue does something completely different than yellow after purple. And it's an ongoing research where I make five works, see how they turn out, and I learn from them, and then start the next five works. And so these works refer back to my interactive compositions, but then in a different way. And for example, this kind of very soft uh, approach to color is very hard in the browser. So in the lenticulars, I try to do things that I can't do in the browser. And in the browser, I try to do things that I can't do in the lenticulars. Um, then it's an interesting problem when you make websites. Galleries start to be interested. They're like, oh, it would be great to do a show. And then you have to think of how do you show a website in a gallery. And th the problem is when you just put a computer in a gallery, it's very small. And TVs, I'm not such a fan of. They're still quite small. So I, I want to create experiences that you feel like you're surrounded by it and you're, you're in it. Because when you're at home on the web, you're completely in your machine. You don't think of it. But when you're walking in a gallery and you see a laptop on a pedestal, it becomes a sculpture. So I started working with mirrors to, to expand the space and expand the, the amount of light that comes in and the, the amount of moving image that you absorb. So again, it, it, it's this similar work. And sometimes I'll make an interactive work and make it run automatically in the gallery. Just it, It's a constant fluid thing of re-evaluating how the work should behave. It's a, sometimes letting a work run by itself is a more interesting experience than having a mouse there. And then the other thing I find interesting about uh, websites is that they're very fluid. And that means they can be shown on, at any scale. This is in uh, Korea. It's one of the largest screens in Asia. I think it's 23 stories high. And I always thought websites, I'm sure a lot of you guys here design websites or apps, so you always think about Whatever potential space there is, it should fill it up. It should maximize whatever screen estate you have. And then that's what we did here. And then the next.
next step was New York. So that's Times Square, and uh, they have a prob uh, they have a program called Midnight Moments. And it means Times Square is about a hundred screens or something, and about sixty percent of those screens dedicate three minutes every midnight to art. And so there's the Times Square Alliance, and they keep requesting from all the screen owners, can you donate three minutes of your time at midnight? And so every month they'll show a different work. Uh, and then we showed this kissing animation. Um, it was a wonderful experience. It's a very bizarre experience. It, it, I went to Times Square a few times before. A lot of things I didn't know about people. I, I didn't know people love to look at ads. It's a general belief that ads are stupid, but people will fly from all around the world to sit at Times Square and look at ads. And not exaggerating, people will spend hours. So I, I went there, there's a famous staircase right here where they sell the Broadway tickets. And in the summer, people are sitting there with a bag of potato chips and a Coke, and they will sit there for four hours, look at ads. Because I, I went there to see how do people experience Times Square. So I walked around a lot, and I would come back an hour later, same people still sitting there. So I, I think a solution for ads would be to just have ads in one area of the city, and then that's it. The rest of the world is ad-free, and then people can just sit there, have potato chips, and look at ads. Um, the other thing that's interesting, in the summer, it, there's all this construction, and there's all these people. I thought, if there's any physical manifestation of hell, it's Times Square. It's so awful, and so, but at the same time, it's fascinating. I, imagine if hell really existed. That I would be more interested to see hell than heaven. I mean, heaven, I can imagine, but hell would be... So that's Times Square. Um, on to the next. I'll show one funny website, and we can laugh a little bit. This is trashloop.com. <laughs> so you can do this all day. <laughs> so there's the, an interesting question. Uh, if we really develop <laughs> machines that do everything we don't want to do, what do we want to do? What are we going to spend our time on? Uh, so it, I, a lot of people say, oh, I'm so busy. I wish I had more time. More time for what? What would you really like to do? So maybe this is it. Um, and I'm, I'm very serious. It's going to be a weird question uh, for humanity. What do you want to do? Because we've never, w there's so many things we have to do, we don't have to think about what we want to do. Uh, so let's see what humanity wants to do. I think the future, there will be four professions. There will be artist, scientist, athlete, and stoner. Those are probably the four main directions of life. Um, so, I invite everyone to go to neuraphael.com and uh, make a, about 10 websites a year, so I'm always working on it. Um, to tell a little bit about my model, when I started, I started putting each website in its own domain name. Uh, there was a choice, around 2000 I started, there was a lot of people making experiments on the web, and they always named these experiments a-27-3, version something like that. It was always very techy, sort of like a programmer, copy the folder, make an adjustment, next version. Next and they didn't feel very precious because of that, and they all disappeared. And I thought, if I put each work in its own domain name, I'm committed to keeping the work alive, and you can remember where it is. I, I saw a lot of benefits in having it in a domain name. So this is somethingopen.com, and there's uh, trashloop.com, all these domain names. But it also makes the work sellable, and it's important to sell stuff so you can make more of it. Um, so the, the domain name is one of the few scarcities on the web, and that means everything on the web is infinitely copyable, every MP3, every JPEG, but a domain name you can really own. So when a collector says, oh, I love this website, I want to buy it, um, like this website, then the domain name is transferred to the owner, the Cerves family, and then they own the website. It's really simple, actually. It's, 
there's no copyright protection or whatever. And then they sign a contract, I want the work always to be accessible. It's important for me, it seems to me obvious that if you make something, you want people to see it. So that's the idea, and then I feel like this way I'm working on having my own museum that's always available to everybody. Because most artists make work and then it's hardly seen. It's spread out across different collections and you see it, one work here, one work there. But I want people to see the whole path. Um, how we do, do you want to do a Q&A? I just want to show one more project. Um, this is a project called Abstract Browsing. Um, well, I need to type better. So it's a Chrome extension that if you visit websites, you can click a button and it abstracts them. It just removes all information uh, and replaces it with color. So if you go to New York Times or whatever website and you hit the button, you see the composition instead of the information. So it, I call it the information superhighway, but without the information. It just becomes a super highway, and you can explore. And I'm very interested in this non-human approach to composition. So humans decide sort of where things should be, but then through deep learning and research and users, they start to decide, OK, this website is more efficient. If the ad is over there, if the menu is over there, we get more clicks. So you get these unintentional compositions um, that are different. A painter will sit down and say, this should be there because that's what I want. Websites do it. This should be there because it's more efficient. And so I made this plugin, and then I translated it to tapestries because tapestries turns out were the beginning of the history of the computer. So these are woven uh, in Tilburg in the Netherlands, and I choose the most, to me, the most exciting compositions. Uh, that's IMDB, that's the Twitter feed, that's Gmail. And the interesting thing for me about freezing the abstract browsing project is that it, it intensifies the looking. Like the web is very fast and fluid, and it's just bam, bam, bam. And then every morning, I make about 100 screenshots. And so I have about 3,000 screenshots a month. And I go through them, and then it's really this long process. Why is this one more interesting than the other? And um, so that's the interesting process for me, is narrowing it down to six works. It's a sort of similar problem that we have with digital photography. Like you have a bazillion photos. Which one mean anything to you, and why are they interesting? And we're trying to develop AI that can decide that for us. But I still think there's a human factor that uh, I think ultimately computers can be very creative. They can, you can tell a computer come up with stuff, but it'll be, I don't know if computers can edit. Uh, maybe they will, but how can they decide which work? It's a mysterious question. Why is one work more interesting than the other? Why is one composition uh, more interesting than the other? So that's abstract browsing.